Greetings, greetings, fellow Who Gazers, and welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the podcast taking you through the world of the target novelizations in publication order. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. We have a new Doctor Who, and his name is Shudi Gatwa. A few days ago, I was privileged to join Mark, Jan, and UK Jason over on Trap One, where we spent a merry hour enthusing over the new Doctor. I'll post a link to that episode in the show notes. Don't miss it. The history of me reading Doctor Who and the planet of the Daleks is a history of me missing the point. When this aired on PBS in the 1980s and early 90s, it was as a five-part adventure with no explanation for the missing episode 3, and with episodes 4, 5, and 6 each being moved up a number and renumbered 3, 4, and 5. So when I wrote the cliffhangers into the book, I used the PBS numbering scheme, meaning that episode 3 of the book takes up four chapters instead of the usual two. I'm not even sure now if I knew that the story was even missing an episode, as televised. Then in 2011, for the earliest incarnation of my Doctor Who novels blog, I wrote up a capsule entry for the story. Reading it now, I have (laughs) zero recollection of ever having written it in the first place. It's really bad writing on my part, as I said a whole bunch of things that I don't believe now and that I'm pretty sure I'd never even believed to begin with. I complained that the book was, quote, Terrence on autopilot, and I even said that the TV story was two episodes too long. Gah, I can't stand it when people say that. So, exactly none of that 2011 blog post has been incorporated into this episode. Now, Planet of the Daleks the book is short, and noticeably less detailed compared to the Terrence books that preceded it in the Target publication run. But if you ignore the page count, and ignore the fact that it condenses or deletes a lot of TV material, it still has a lot of Terrence's usual magic on each individual page. So... Let's get to it. Who's got the power, the power to read? Who looks into books for the answers we need? Welcome back to Doctor Who Literature. This is the conversation portion of episode 26. One of the reasons why I love doing this show is because I get to spend an hour a week talking about Doctor Who with friends of mine and living uh, with a partner and a child who have minimal interest in Doctor Who. These are not conversations that I get to have. So, here, I can talk about Doctor Who with friends, and I have a very good friend who's joining us for the first time, Conrad. Welcome to the program, and thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me on. What a thrill. Um, I was just saying to you, like, I don't think I've ever been on Doctor Who podcast talking about books before, so this is a first. I'm intrigued. There are a few really good book-themed podcasts. I just did an episode of uh, the Doctor Who Target podcast, book club podcast run out of the states by my friend tony witt and we just talked about horns of nymon which is a fun book and of everybody on the panel i enjoyed horns of nymon the most so for Uh me it was good to spread the nymon gospel so to speak (laughs) good to know good to know but as far as i know you are appearing on the only doctor who podcast that discusses the target books in publication order so i have created a niche and you are now a valuable part of my niche I'm very happy to be in your niche. Uh, I'm trying to have a response that is not going to get us muted by the censors. No, there's no way. Let's just leave that hanging uncomfortably in the air. You can enter my niche anytime. Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, just we're digging ourselves deeper. It's okay. okay. All right. Let's let's awkwardly change topics then. (laughs) So you and I have talked a lot about Doctor Who over the years. We've never really talked much about your big finish, but I have a question that I'm dying to ask you. Okay, far away. In 2013, we get the surprise bonus Paul McGann mini episode called Night of the Doctor, which nobody knew uh, was coming, unless you happen to be at the right convention at the right time, overhearing a conversation that you weren't supposed to hear the week before, which is what happened to me. But Night of the Doctor drops, and as Paul McGann is regenerating into John Hurt, he starts naming all of his big Finnish companions, people that he worked with in the recording booth, and your character came up. So, number one, were you watching live? Number two, did you know the episode was coming? Number three, did you know that your name was in the episode? And number four, what was your reaction? 
Okay, if I can remember that one first. I didn't watch it live. I, I think I was just out in the street and I got a text from somebody saying, go to your television now. Have you, have you seen Have you seen it? And I was like, it's, no, what? And they're like, it's Doctor Who. There's a thing on now. Go and watch it. And I was like, okay, well, I think you should probably see it. And I was like, okay, great. I'll watch that when I get home. Um, so the second question was, did I know? So what was the second question? Did you know in advance that it was coming? No. And did you know in advance that your name was in it? Okay, I absolutely didn't know there was anything like that, and I certainly didn't know. I don't. I wasn't expecting any kind of mini episode. I certainly didn't know Paul was was doing anything, um, and so no, I absolutely didn't know my name was in it at all. So I remember your fourth question, which was what was the reaction? Um, I mean, I, th- I think I had the same reaction watching it than every, everybody else did. When I saw Paul, I was just gobsmacked. My jaw was on the floor, like all of us. We were. I, I mean. What an ama- like of all the ma- barking mad things that were happening in the build up, I don't think any of us, any of us saw that coming. So I was, I, it was a slap around the chops like everyone else. It was amazing. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was actually brilliant. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then when it came to the regeneration, which was really, really exciting. I remember him saying Charlie and I just heard him say Charlie and I just lit up and I just was like, oh my God. And I didn't think there'd be any more than that because you, your brain is processing very fast. And then the other names came and uh, my character's name was in there as well. And I kind of just went, I think I, I, it just went right through me. I think I kind of, yeah, I think my adrenaline and heart rate went up and I think I sort of went red. That's my, <laughs> um, so yeah, it was amazing. I, but it was, I was very chuffed actually, v- very, very surprised. And, and, but it was lovely actually. It was really lovely because it had actually been quite a long time had passed. I hadn't seen Paul, I think, since I was last in the studio with him. So it was a really nice, I mean, how could you not? I mean, what a dream come true. Doctor Who is actually, I mean, I remember Tom Baker used to go up to kids and say, haven't I seen you watching you on, haven't I seen you before? I think you watched me on Saturday nights. I was like, well, this is, I mean, Doctor Who kind of talked, actually talked to me out of the telly. So absolutely mind blowing. And I take that, you know, my, my, uh, you know, my experience of Big Finish was a right old mixture. It was a difficult time during Big Finish and it was pretty rocky. And so we had our ups and downs, but like that, how could you be anything other than being incredibly grateful and proud? That's like a dream come true. So I feel very, very, very happy about that. And do you know if Stephen Moffat always wrote the script so that such that all the big Finnish companions were in there, or did Paul do that on his own as an ad lib to pay tribute to all of his coworkers? God, I knew I should have come on this podcast. You're asking the very, very good questions because <laughs> uh, I was at a some party or other. I think it might have been a Doctor Who magazine party around the time of the fiftieth, and it was just after that had happened. I think it was like literally the week or two after, and. I was at the bar and somebody, there were a couple of rumours going around. Somebody said, oh, I think Paul wanted to do that or it was Paul's idea. And I was like, right, okay. And I wasn't sure, but they weren't sure. It was all a bit, they weren't sure. And I thought, well, Stephen Moffat's on the other side of the room. I'm going to go and ask him. So I just walked over to the other side of the room, tapped him <laughs> on the shoulder and said, you know, you, you mentioned all these big Finnish characters. And I, I like, I happened to play one of them. What, what, why, what, how did that, why, why was that? How, how did that come about? And and he just went, because we're very nice. Like that. In a, just, in, a, in, a, in a not particularly nice way. And I was like, thanks. And just went off. So we'll never know. <laughs> But, um, so there we go. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know whose idea it was, but um, <laughs> I, tr- I tried to ask, and that was the answer I got. <laughs> that is definitely a harsh your buzz answer. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, nice talking. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> there we go. The, the, oh there you go. That, that is, that, the, do you know what? That's it in a nutshell. These are, Those are very much the kind of ups and downs of, of throwing yourself into the world of Doctor Who. And, and, that was very much what it was like doing it. There was loads of highs, there was loads of weird bumps, and you just took it all as the big barking mad ride it was. But Doctor Who saluted me on the telly, and um, I'm canon apparently, so that's whatever that means. I, I'm here to canonize. I can. I'm here to. Uh, I can officially um, approve any bad opinions you've got. I can kiss babies. I can, you know, open supermarkets. I mean, it's my power is limitless. You can answer headcanon questions. That's great. Yeah, authoritatively. Yeah, because I'm kind of so whatever I say is is good. So <laughs> come to me for your opinion, your opinions, and I will I will thoroughly uh, consecrate them. 
So when did you first become a fan of Doctor Who? Because I know for folks who grew up in England, it's a very different answer than folks who grew up here in the States, where Doctor Who is a sort of niche, very different kind of fandom vibe over here. But how about for you? When did you first become a fan? Yeah. Now, it, Doctor Who's always been in my life. I had my sister who's five years older than me who was always watching it. So, um, you know, Doctor Who's kind of woven into my memories. It, it's, it's all sort of always been there. I knew I absolutely loved it and watched it every week when and my era was was Tom Baker, Liz Sladen, you know, so Genesis the Daleks, Zygons, Pyramids was my childhood. So I and I loved it and I was obsessed about Doctor Who. In terms of like that moment where you become a fan and start doing fan like stuff, I suppose actually it was, I think it was when Colin Baker was there. I think I just hit an age where I was like, I am now, I want to sign up, I want to become a member of you know, the Doctor Who Appreciation Society, I'm writing letters, I want autographs, I'm signing stuff, you know, I think that's probably when I fully would, like, started doing really fan things, but I always loved it, so I think that's, yeah. So you joined organized fandom during the Colin Baker era, which is kind of when the ship was starting to sink, (laughs) water's coming in, the rats are scurrying down the ropes, uh, getting the heck out of Dodge, so... What was the vibe of fandom like in the late eighties? Was it kind of a, a you know a kind of a funeral vibe? You know, like we're here, but it's not what it used to be. We're like Wizkid in Greatest Show in the Galaxy, or is it more like we think the show is as good as it's ever been, and why is nobody else watching the way that we are? Um, it was an exact split of that, and I would say it's sort of as like social media is now. It, appear, it, it, it appears because social media will only only wants extreme opinions. So it would have you believe that you either love it or you hate it. And it was sort of like that. But instead of digitally, it was fanzines and stuff. So I do remember some some fanzines were absolutely like, especially after the hiatus and the trial of a Time Lord, it was very much like, it's back, let's publicize it. We love Doctor Who. And equally, there were fanzines coming in with just absolutely hateful front covers. JNT must go, all of that kind of stuff. So it was, it was, it was very polarized. I mean, it wasn't an easy time, and it was so it was very polarized. But I was very much on team. Hooray, we love Doctor Who. And I think one major advantage of being a fan at that time was that Colin Baker was the incumbent Doctor, and we, I got to meet him a few times. And meeting Colin Baker especially then whatever he is I, w- I went to see him in a play in, in uh, the theater and afterwards there was a few of us nerds hanging around backstage and he not only came out did all the photographs all the autographs he was like wait a minute i'm going to see if i can follow me follow me and he took us on this huge backstage tour of the theater and he spent out like i'm not exaggerating hours with us oh wow That's he was great amazing gent. so to be honest i mean i, I you wouldn't want for better than that he was you know you couldn't ask for a more wonderful doctor to meet than colin so i was very very happy yeah i have seen colin in multiple conventions here in the states and i haven't really had that kind of face-to-face encounter with him because i'm kind of on the shy side well you wouldn't know it from this podcast so i don't know i'm not always good about going up to my heroes but everybody that i know who has had a one-on-one with colin baker has just the most you know he's just the most generous guy with his time and he's really really kindly to the fans and he really appreciates his role in the show's history so having that is just a remarkable thing because there are so many other you know performers who kind of resent the spot they're put in and they don't want to be involved so to have someone like colin baker at the exact moment that you're entering mainstream i mean imagine if you had entered mainstream fandom and you met him and he was a total jerk that might have totally changed the trajectory of of the next 30 40 years 100% 100% and, and what he's been like since the show you know how he's especially how the BBC treated him he'd be forgiven for never wanting to touch it with the barge pole again but the fact he's never stopped being our doctor is just a testament to what dude he is we love Colin he came to New York we had a Doctor Who fan club in New York which is now largely defunct but he came to an event probably about 40 or 50 fans in the room uh, at the back room of a bar in Gramercy, uh, which is in the East 20s in, in Manhattan, if you've been. And, you know, he was just, again, I didn't sp- I didn't speak to him one-on-one because, you know, terrified, but he was he had, the, he had the funniest stories. He was very personable. Everybody really got a, just a buzz out of speaking to him. And he's telling stories about, you know, getting cast in the role and funny stories about his agent and the phone calls that he received. And, Again, just a remarkable guy. So again, you're you're lucky that he was there at your very beginning. 
yeah, yeah. No, he's 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 wonderful. What about you? What was what was Doctor Who like in so like in eighty five, eighty six, eighty seven around that time? What was where we where were you with fandom and stuff then? Where was your? It was an interesting mix between people who were obsessive and people who'd never heard of it. So. I was 11 years old, which is coincidentally the same age that my daughter is now, but she has no interest. But I had two friends at school, John and Stephen, both of whom are still friends today, although they live far away from New York now. They were both watching the show on PBS, and they they knew that I was a science fiction guy. They knew that I liked Star Trek. They knew that I would love the show if I just sat down to watch it. And they spent weeks trying to persuade me, telling me what happened last night, trying to get me to watch it. And I always had an excuse so finally, one night, I turn on Channel 21, our local PBS station out of Long Island, New York, where we lived. And there was, I later figured it out, I figured it out that the day that I was watching was November 23rd, 1984. Wow. Of all the days to randomly flip on the TV. And it was Time Fly Part 1, and I watched about 90 seconds where the doctor goes from the Concord flight deck into the hold and climbs into the TARDIS, and the TARDIS is sideways the control room. And I watched 90, I said, this is not, this is not interesting at all. So I turned it off <clears throat> and the next day I go to school. Yeah, I watched it. Didn't like it. Never mind. And they were like, no, you didn't give it a fair chance. So the following Monday I try again and now it's arc of infinity part two. And the very, the very first cliffhanger that I saw was the one where the doctor is disintegrated. And this, it turns to the camera in tears. And that was the moment. Wow. This is a show. like nothing I've ever seen. This is amazing. I've got to see how this ends. And of course, I missed the next night, but I watched Ark of Infinity Part 4, the whole thing, where yeah. they're running around Amsterdam and where the Doctor shoots Omega, and Omega is the Doctor briefly before he turns into Ian Collier. And this is incredible. I love this. And then I didn't watch again for another week, and I missed all of Snake Dance. Then I watched Margin on Dead, and I saw that famous Part 3 cliffhanger where he goes, you know, it's the end of me as a Time Lord. I'd never heard of the Time Lords before, and I loved it. Missed another week, missed all of Terminus. But the moment from which there was no turning back was Enlightenment Part 1, the cliffhanger where they pull back the shutters and they're in space. Peace. From that moment on, I never voluntarily missed another episode. So every episode of Doctor Who that has aired from December 1984 to the present, I have not missed it voluntarily. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And then a few months later, they announced that Creation Conventions is bringing, I forget who they were bringing, but they did a convention in early 1985. And this was when season 22 had just started airing in the UK. So they brought Attack of the Cybermen and Vengeance on Varos to screen. And I desperately wanted to go. My parents wouldn't take me. So my friend Stephen went with his dad and they saw those two episodes and he came back to school and reported that he's seen Colin Baker and he was telling stories about the um, attack of the Cybermen. He says, you wouldn't believe the names the doctor calls Perry. And I'm like, Oh, I wish I was there. So a few months later, they offer another convention, right? So they have a convention on July 27th, 1985. And if you go back and listen, episode 17, where I talk about the three doctors, I tell the story of my very first convention. Matthew Waterhouse that. was there as the guest, but for whatever reason, we never saw hide nor hair of him. We spent a couple of hours in the dealer's room, spent a couple of hours on the sofa reading the novelizations that I bought in the dealer's room in the lobby. Uh, my father was looking at all these grown men walking around in Tom Baker scarves. And he thought we were at a Truman Capote convention because he didn't know about the <laughs> scarf and he didn't understand the dress. And he wouldn't buy me jelly babies because of the banned ingredients. <laughs> he said, this is, this is junk. This is poison. I'm, I'm not buying this for you. Um, and then we saw the screening of Dalek invasion of earth, which was shown in movie format. You saw the screening. You were left alone in that screening room, weren't you? Didn't you say about that story? He, you were like you. He you were... left. He went to chock full of nuts across the street, and he spent the next two hours drinking bitter coffee, wondering where did I go wrong raising a son who was a fan of this. But he came back for the last half hour, standing in the door, watching the last half hour. And he he thought, you know, this is a film transfer. It's bad kinescope quality. How can you sit through this? We didn't even watch TV like this in the '60s. And why do they spend 15 minutes in the movie writing out Susan? He just didn't get it. The magic was not there for him at all. So either, you've either got it or you haven't. Yeah. I was mesmerized. I had already known about the first, I had read the Unearthly Child novelization and probably a couple of others. So I knew who Ian and Susan and Barbara were. I was surprised that William Russell's voice was as high pitched as it was 
because I was expecting a deep, booming, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger-style action hero voice or Sylvester Stallone. And now, of course, the joke is on me because as a grown-up, my voice is higher than William Russell's ever was. But that was the big thing that I noticed about Dalek Invasion of Earth. Ian's voice is not what I thought it was at all. That's true. He hasn't got that. The equivalent in America would be a, you know, a square-jawed butch kind of hero. Where, of course, we've got a history teacher in a cardigan. So, yeah, that's, that checks out. But I, I, I loved it. And then the next episode they were screening after that was The Seeds of Death. And if I had stuck around to watch The Seeds of Death, that might have ended my fandom. <laughs> because it's not objectively a story that I like. But, you know, it's it's late. My father wants to get home. He's got other things to do on a weekend other than hang around the, the Roosevelt Hotel in Manhattan. So we missed The Seeds of Death. We missed Matthew Waterhouse. But that was my first con. I bought like six or seven novelizations and i was sitting there on the couch reading keys of marinus in the hotel lobby reading the trial scenes and i was mesmerized and that was when i learned that i'm an 11 year old boy who likes courtroom drama and now Uh flash forward 35 years and what do i do for a living thank you keys of marinus (laughs) thank you philip hinchcliffe and thank you of course to the stones of blood which i had just seen on tv a couple of weeks earlier where tom baker puts on the the, the barrister's wig (laughs) This is all starting to make sense. This is, it's all starting to make sense now. So I have Doctor Who to thank for my fandom and my career. But other kids, you know, either they love Doctor Who or they didn't know what it was and they didn't want to talk about it. So I tried to initiate a lot of conversations with folks who couldn't care less. I bored a lot of people before I learned to keep it to myself. And then, you know, I start to get older. When I went away to university at uh, age 17, going on 18, seven years later, I quickly decided, you know what? The last Doctor Whos that I've seen have not spoken to me. I did not like Time and the Ranny. I did not appreciate Curse of Fenrir because I hated the bit where the Doctor had to shatter Ace's faith. That mm. just was a little too close to home for me. At this point, I was, you know, being raised by a single mom by this point, and it just was too hurtful. So I didn't. And then Survival, I hated Survival, and to this day, I just do not like Survival, making me the one person in Doctor Who fandom who does not like Survival. That's okay. Yeah, you won't. Be, you won't be the only one. That's for sure. You you just have to find your tribe. Yeah. I do, especially when you look at the new series and the Doctor wants to reform the Master. Uh, you know, in survival, he leaves the Master to it. And I thought that was you know just it wasn't where my heart was. So I went to college a little bit disaffected with Doctor Who, and I had this moment where I was, you know, trying to pay my first college tuition bill, and I'd spent three hundred dollars on my Doctor Who novelizations. And I had this crisis of faith. This is money that I've wasted on books that I'm never going to read again. Of course, little did I know where life would bring me. Well, here we are now, making full good use of them. My father's older sister had been one of the original Trekkies in the 1960s, and she was a huge Star Trek fan. So she passed on to me a lot of her memorabilia. So she was getting she was getting zines. And she had this promotional kit from The Wrath of Khan before it was even Star Trek. It was still Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. I have somewhere a Star Trek The Wrath of Khan deck of playing cards with the wrong title. Because she had gotten it through her fandom connections. So she had gotten me – she had given me her whole series of of Star Trek. It was a Star Trek poster fanzine. It was written on a folded-up sheet of paper. And when you opened it up, it was a single enormous poster – with one photo still from a Star Trek episode in the middle. And on the other side were all the pages from the zine. And they actually had an interview with Leonard Nimoy in one of them. So I had this enormous blow-up of Kirk and Spock and McCoy from Spectre of the Gun hanging on my dorm room wall. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm a Star Trek fan. This is what I do. But they had this sale on campus the first month of school of things with which to decorate your dorm room walls. And they had all these photo stills from movies and glossies of actors. So I bought four photos. I bought a still photo from Forbidden Planet, the the movie. I bought a still photo from The Wrath of Khan. I bought a glossy pinup of Winona Ryder. I want that one back. And then I bought, (laughs) they had a photo still from Death to the Daleks of of John Pertwee standing in front of paper mache rocks, standing in front of a balsa wood Dalek. And half of John Abeneri is in the picture. And I had that tucked away in the corner of my dorm room. I was like, what is that? I'm like, that's Doctor Who. What? <laughs> so I that's where that. I was at in college. Then, that was the same semester the New Adventures came out, and I discovered one kid in my dorm who was a huge Doctor Who fan, and he went to the bookstore and bought the first two New Adventures. All right. So I went to the store, and I bought the first two New Adventures 
six months later, I discovered Rec Arts Doctor Who, and that was it. I was back in, and I was talking about Doctor Who, and I finally found my tribe, and I, I was there at the very beginning of the new adventures, and uh, you know, I was reading Love and War in one night, and talking about the books again, and now here we are 30 years later, and I have a podcast, and you're on it. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. I love the fact you must be. I, I love the fact that there's some. There's just some other parallel life where Winona Ryder is on. Is a sort of on posted on the wall next to John Abenary and John Pertwee. I think that's uh, that's fabulous. Although to be quite honest, I've been listening to a podcast. Uh, there's a podcast called The Two Fifty Out of Ireland, and they discuss the uh, the top two hundred and fifty films of all time as ranked by the IMDb. And the episode that I'm listening to now is The Godfather Part Three. Which was supposed to star both Winona Ryder and John Abenary. Oh, it's oh my goodness! And and here you are, the Godfather of a uh, Doctor Who novels podcast. <laughs> Tenuous, but that's what we're calling you. Except Winona Ryder had to remove herself from the filming of the Godfather Part Three, and she was replaced by Sofia Coppola. Yeah. And if you watch the most recent recut of the Godfather that Coppola did during the pandemic, he has removed John Abenary's one line. So John Abenary has been taken out of the Godfather canon. Yeah, showbiz man, it'll kill you. I'm just glad that John was no longer <laughs> alive tough. to see that happen. No, no, that's true. Oh dear, poor John. So here you are, a guest on my show, and I'm doing all the talking. So let me turn it back over I love to you. This. I have you talking about an, a book that predates your fandom because we're talking about Planet of the Daleks from 1973. The episode is older than me. Then you started watching a couple of years later. What is your experience with Planet of the Daleks, the episode? And then what is your experience with Planet of the Daleks, the 119-page novelization? Hmm. Um, with the episodes, I think I probably saw them in the repeat that they did over here on the BBC in November, December 1993. I think that's probably the first time I saw it. And it went out with the black and white episode three. Um, oh, they wow. did it as a, and they did a sort of little, made a little sort of series of it called Doctor Who and the Daleks, they called it, with a little, fo- so these, each episode went out with a five minute little featurette beforehand one was about unit one was about missing episodes one was about doctor antiques um so yeah i think that was the first time i would have watched it properly uh around the same time uk gold uh, cable channel here was repeating doctor Who, so i know i would have seen it there as well and i would have taped it um so i think that's the time i first time i saw the series in terms of the book um which I, I have the one here that was, like I've mentioned, my sister, who's five years older. There we are, snap. We've both got the red Tom Baker logo version. Yes. Um, so th- my sister would have had this. She had a lot of the Target books, and I sort of inherited some from her, and then I started buying them myself. Um, this So this is the original. It's falling apart. It's very well loved. And there are a few, I don't think I read this one. To be honest, and I have to confess this, like I have always been an impatient and very poor reader. I tend to get very enthusiastic about buying a book, reading chapter one and two, going, that looks a really good book, and then putting it down and never picking it back up again. Um, (laughs) I did actually go back through and I realized that I think um, consistently with what I told you, when I became a fan, like real fan, that most of the target novels that I read I remember reading in a row, The Myth Makers, The Invasion, Fury from the Deep. It's that era. Again, 85, 86. So that was when yes. I actually read most of them. But um, this book is quite revealing. It's falling apart. It's quite well loved. But um, I opened it, and to my surprise, well, there's, the first thing I noticed was on the cover, you can't actually see this, but I can feel there's little indentations around the Dalek because I have tried to put a tracing paper on top of it and to try to learn how to draw Daleks. So that's the f- that tells you what kind of kid wow. I was. Also, I have I know now this is look away book lovers because this is I've got my name and address that I oh wrote in it when I was a kid, uh, and it gets better this or worse. Check out this contents page, and we're going to have to post this online because this is so bad. Look at my own little illustration there. And you are going to have to send me a photo of that, and I will put a link to it. That is amazing. That is like photorealistic art of Daleks and Exelons and the TARDIS. That is they've incredible. Got the right, they've got the right number of bumps. They're, yeah, I, drawing Daleks and TARDISes is my thing. So I opened that book, and I was like, of course. This was me all over. I was um, I was always about the, the – the, the, I was – you know, when I grew up, there was stuff like um, – I mean, there wasn't a lot of merchandise, and you know how much I love my Weetabix cards. So I was very glad oh, to yes. see that 
There is also a gold uh, Dalek, a Supreme, Dalek Supreme in Weetabix card form, which I've just held up, which I will also post. Um, right next to a Quark from the Dominators. Together, <laughs> together at last. That's what Planet Like Winona Ryder and John Abeniri. It was never meant to be, but there they are. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So, yeah, so I actually, I'm not sure. So I think I, I've defaced this book. I've learned, I've used it to learn how to draw Daleks on the front cover and then promptly drawn Daleks in it. Um, terrible. What an appalling child. Um, so actually this time was actually the first time reading this one. So how about you, Planet of the Daleks? When did you first see it and when did you first read it? See, I was one of the lucky ones here in the States. I know I've told the story on other versions of this podcast, so stop me if you've heard this 17 times. But in New York, I was at a confluence of five different PBS stations that were all showing Doctor Who in the mid-80s, and they were all showing different eras of the show at different times. So Channel 20 on my cable box was out of Boston, and they were three weeks ahead of me uh, with the late Peter Davis in years in early 85. Uh, Channel 21, after finishing Caves of Androzani in January 85, they didn't, of course, have season 22, which was still airing. So they circled back around to Tom Baker. So I started watching Tom Baker throughout most of 85. The New Jersey station out of Montclair, New Jersey. And then, of course, flash forward, I have a lot of friends now who live in Montclair, which is kind of like the unofficial sixth borough of New York City at this point. Once you get married and have kids and you can't afford your Brooklyn apartment, you move out to a larger house in Montclair, New Jersey. They were the Doctor Who epicenter. They were making a lot of documentaries in the mid-80s about Doctor Who. And they had uh, you know, all the guests come in for their pledge breaks in the middle of episodes. So they were the first ones to get the John Pertwee package. So in the middle of 85, they got all Pertwee. And they got it as movie format. And they would show one episode every Saturday night starting at 11 p.m. Problem number one, I'm 11. I'm not staying up that late at night. So I have vivid recollections of falling asleep in the middle of what would have been episode three of the Silurians because it was already midnight and I didn't see the end of it for years. Problem number two, we had, this is the 80s. So we had two TVs, but the large TV in the basement, oh, sorry, the, in, we, we had a basement and that was where the family room was with this huge for the time, it was an enormous 19-inch TV in a 300-inch cabinet, which which is the way you watch television back then. That's right. So it was a color TV, and that's where the cable was, and that's where you'd watch this station out of New Jersey. My parents would want to watch TV on a Saturday night, and if they were out, and I was babysitting my kid sister, if they were taping something on the VCR, I was not allowed to watch Doctor Who because you couldn't, with that VCR, watch one channel and tape another. So I very rarely got to watch Pertwee. And what I didn't know is that Planet of the Daleks, they were only airing five out of the six episodes because that black and white episode was not part of the syndication package. So when I finally got to see Planet of the Daleks, there's this huge 25-minute cut in the middle, and I didn't even... I'm like, wait a minute, did, did I fall asleep? No, no, what's going on here? This is disjointed. And then when my local PBS station got Planet of the Daleks in episode format, they would only show it as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So episode 4 was re- – sorry, episode 5 was retitled as episode 4 and so on. So when I was sitting there with the book in my hands writing down the cliffhangers every 25 minutes, you'll see at the top of chapter 9 I wrote episode 4 because I didn't know that it was really episode 5 and I didn't know there was a missing episode in black and white. And I found out years later, and I didn't get to see that black and white version until, I guess, maybe the late 90s they officially released it. Right, yeah. And now, of course, it's colorized on DVD, and nobody would know that it's missing. But if you look at my novelization, I never went back and fixed the missing cliffhanger. There we go. And I'm now relieved that you've also defaced your book, although you used writing instead of scribbles. Oh, I have put cast lists in my book. I have written the date that I saw it on TV. I have written in cliffhangers in the book that were not on, that were not in the book. Like the cliffhanger to episode one of the Daleks, I wrote in in ink. Captain Rack's famous rant at the end of Enlightenment Part Three, I've written that that in in ink in twelve year old scrawl because it wasn't part of the novelization. Oh, this is making me feel so much better. Scribble in your books, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Please be like Conrad. Be like me. Well, be yeah, more like but- Conrad than me, but. Uh, 
Definitely pop, write in your novelizations. That's it. Pop along to your local library. Borrow some of theirs. Scribble in theirs. They'll be delighted. <laughs> so I didn't read Planet of the Daleks highly, number one, because I was only seeing a portion of it. And I thought the book was not Terrence's best. It wasn't until the last year and a half that I've come around on this story. I know Mark Gatiss has gone on record as saying this was the book that changed his life. I know that Mark Gatiss recorded the audiobook because he loves it so much. Yeah. I just couldn't see it in that light. But then I did my pilgrimage. And in the spring of 2021, I watched all of the Pertwee era in 60 days, because that's how long it takes, watching two parts a night. And I suddenly realized Planet of the Daleks, all right, it's got some issues. It's Terry Nation on autopilot. Prentice Hancock, I've met. He is a lovely man, but as a hard-bitten villain, he's not really the guy you want. Um, doesn't really make Weber a very believable character. The TV story, and looking at the most superficial level, I grew up in the 70s, right? So for me, it's all about Star Trek, where you have these enormous red and green and gold jerseys on your screen. I grew up in the era where all the baseball teams had pastel colored uniforms. Half the teams had powder blue uniforms for road games. The Baltimore Orioles had bright orange jerseys. The Pittsburgh Pirates wore canary yellow for about 10 years. The Cleveland Indians wore blood red uniforms. And one of the players said, I resemble a blood clot wearing this. So I come from the era where bright colors on TV are endorphin for the brain. And you look at this and you're soothed by the colors. Planet of the Daleks is the most gorgeously designed story in the entire classic run because of all the colors that you never see anywhere else. You have John Pertwee's velvet costume. Gorgeous. You have like ice blue. The Daleks actually hired an interior decorator to paint different levels of their underground base, different colors. You have the purple fur robes for the... It is a gorgeous-looking story, and I'm watching it, and I'm getting this same endorphin rush that I got from watching the 1979 World Series where one team is wearing canary yellow and the other is wearing blood orange <laughs> in the same game at the same time. Check that out on YouTube. Or watching Star Trek where the entire screen is Captain Kirk's green jersey or, you know, dead guy red or Mr. Spock yeah. blue. So I love watching the story now because it looks so phenomenal. And, of course, it's John Pertwee at his most charming. It is a good, good, good story. And now that I'm reading the book and I'm comparing the book to the transcript, you can see how much Terrence fixes. He fixes a lot. He changes yeah. some lines. He reorganizes the scenes. Even though the book is 119 pages, and even though I have in the past written online that it is juvenile and not good, you don't realize what good work he's doing until you compare it line by line to the episode transcript. And you realize this is a genius who is taking a fun story and making it even better. Definitely. So I have come around fully. If you look at the DWM survey from 2014, this is literally the middle of the pack. Out of 241 stories, this is number 123. I think yeah. that's unfair. I think this is a top 80, at least, if not higher. But I can see why it's there because it's not, it's not, so remarkable or unusual to be to be super anyone's favorite and it's not offensive enough to be anyone's worst so these sort of things are stories like this are slightly doomed to be in the middle um but it's i think it's only because it isn't hugely remarkable in any particular way but it's like you said it's it's good solid stuff and and like we all know that this is a recycled idea you know that it's very much just like the daleks the story of the daleks done again but it's that doesn't stop it being a good. St it's a really good story, and these ideas, you know, escapes and cells and radiation and bombs and all this stuff. These are good ideas, and yes, we've seen it before. Well, I say we've seen it before. Of course, lots of people haven't. You know, um, so for some people like Mark Gatiss, I can I can well imagine the first time they'd come across come across all these ideas, he was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" Yeah. And just on the color scheme alone, when all else fails, just look at what David Maloney is doing to take this rather pedestrian script and make it memorable. It's just a tribute to what Doctor Who, because you have, the premiere is magic, because you have the best actors, you have the most involved producer and script editor, you have the best directors, except for Douglas Camfield, who for some reason wasn't there. But you have Derek Martinez, you have uh, David Maloney, you have Barry Letts directing a few episodes, uh, you have Patty Russell in there. I mean, 
when you watch the Pertwee era as a marathon and you watch it all in one night, right after the Trouton era where the wheels are falling off, it's really the best era of the show. And right after this is the Green Death, which is one of the top three stories in the entire classic run. So I'm never going to be upset watching the Pertwee era ever, even if it's a story that I like a little bit less, like they have the Daleks or Monster of Peladon. Yeah, it's the era of the show for me, even though it finished airing before I was born. And even though, well, actually, no, I, I, I overlap. I was born the day they were filming Invasion of the Dinosaurs Part One. So I overlap one year of the show. <laughs> but uh, for me, it is just the era. And it is my, my there's a lot of years that are my favorite, but I think this is my prime favorite, the Pertwee era. And this is not the best story, but it's one that I really have a soft spot for. Yeah, and I think I think there's something about the Pertwee era that it it's it's there's something very reliable about it, and it's certainly on a lot of people's comfort lists, you know, and and because uh, because it, it's, it's it's just reliable, and I think it's largely down to obviously Pertwee himself and and uh, Katie Manning and, and that whole family, but like Barry Letts and Terence Dix really underpin it. So you've you've always got something reliable. Of course, you're always going to get those stories that aren't as good as others. But there's some inc- there is some of the best Doctor Who ever in the Pertwee era. But it's some I, you hear a lot of people saying it's their. If you ask them what their comfort one is, they're like, "Oh, I'm gonna, you know, if it's a rainy day or you're feeling ill, you're like, I'm gonna put on a Pertwee, and it's just gonna take you somewhere that's just reliable and solid and comforting and good and sincere. I think, which is it, yeah, that's a very good word for it. Sincere, because it is sincere, because you have Pertwee giving his speeches on bravery and courage, and I have literally used that as parenting advice for my kids. So, yeah, I think that's a really good word for it. Yeah, sincere. It's it's hard as in the right, but it's not cynical. Well, maybe the idea of Terry trying to do the same script over and over again is a little bit cynical on his part, but <laughs> the story he has produced is not cynical at all. Yeah, I, I I think that's yeah, I think that's that's a large part of his appeal. Um, and you love this book enough to sit there and doodle, which begs the question, have you been doodling in the books of lesser Doctor Who stories? If I were to ask you to get me the Android Invasion, do you have crawls dancing all over the page? Mm, I, if I, I were to you ask it. you to pull out the sensorites, do you have uh, an ill-fitting mask with somebody writing, I heard them over, over, I heard them over talking in, in, in a dialogue <laughs> bubble? Or was this the no. only book that you wrote in? I th- I'm sure if I dug, I, I flicked through, there'll be a few more, but I I don't think I the, the the tracing the Dalek on the front is ridiculous. And actually, I want to talk about the cover a bit because um the, the covers is you know good old Chris Achilleos um and it's funny he I, I what I love as well is all this stuff all the uh, in the background all the comets and planets and space dust they're sort of cosmic. The only word for that kind of art is cosmic. Um that was very much in the uh, actually I'm gonna. Now hold up the uh, so I've got a mug. I love these Weetabix cards so much I will never stop talking about them. But like it's very much the style of the art that I grew up with. It's this this very cosmic space stuff. So I love the background of it. You're burying the lead. There was a crawl on that mug. Oh, there was. Oh, I've given away my secret crawl. Ah, oh, crush. I knew yeah. there was going to be a crawl in this conversation. God there it is. Damn it, you b- busted. But yeah, I, I love the, 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 the this is very much my era so the yeah all that cosmic art in the background i absolutely love but i don't like like love this cover as much as the alternative roy knipe version which uh, they've i've seen online which is very similar to the actually i was going to try and get up my phone to hold it up to you but um we'll have to post it afterwards but it's basically it's very similar to the death to the daleks cover the famous death to the daleks cover but I would say, and I'm going to, buying Jason some time now because you can see he's googling it. Um, uh, yeah, I can't, cover, I can't. I can't find it. What was the What was the name of the artist? So, so Roy Knipe. Um, Roy. So it's K N I P E. And I will describe this cover um, as you're googling it. Um, so uh, I, 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 I found it. I definitely yeah. found it. There it is. It isn't that the most beautiful picture of Daleks you've ever seen in your life? I mean, isn't that beautiful? You can see the reflection of the flames in the metal, which is impressive because most of the Daleks were balsa wood, but that is impressive. The level of design, that is that is some impressive light, use of Isn't light. Isn't that 
beautiful and like and also look at the, in the background all the you can see the you know it's called planet of the daleks so he's put a very beautiful pla- sort of forest planet going to the background also and i'm sure we will post this online as well wouldn't that make a great phone background that's that's everyone's new phone background <laughs> like that it's, it's just like it's beautiful truly beautiful i think chris achilleos was selling from his online store he was selling T-shirts. I have the Invasion of the Dinosaurs Kaklak T-shirt, oh. and I wore that. I wore that when I went to London a couple of years ago. And he was selling phone cases where you could buy for your cell phone. I have a regular black OtterBox, but you could buy an OtterBox with Chris Achilleos painting one of his scenes on the back cover. And I really, really, really wanted to do it, and I didn't. And then he passed away, and I never. I assume the store has been taken offline. But I regret not buying more art from the man while he was still there to give us the art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um, but it's a it's a beautiful cover, and I notice as well that uh, this this it's I mean it's a great shot of Pertwee and uh, uh, Taron, I think. Yeah, um, pushing this Dalek into the into the. It's a great action shot, and it's a great action story. Um, but I also noticed that Clayton Hickman for the DVD cover. Uh, used exactly the same picture, although I think he peppered it with a Spyridon on one side and a Dalek Supreme on the other. But he basically reproduced the Planet of the Daleks novel cover for the DVD cover as well. So it's it's a good one. It st- stood the test of time. It's almost unique among the Achilleos covers because Achille- Achilleos wasn't doing scenes, right? He was usually doing collages. Definitely. He was doing three or four characters, usually surrounded by some sort of colorful miasma. I think this is the first time where he actually takes a scene from the story, and it's an iconic. We've seen the still photo over and over again of um, John Pertwee and Bernard Horsfall taking the Dalek prop and shoving it. And here, the Dalek is firing, and there's comets and miasmas in the background. So, uh, certainly, is is eye candy. Yeah, it's really lovely. And also, I'm just noticed like it's because it's a very action based story. Like the um, the Dalek is breaking out of the frame. The actual Dalek itself is breaking out of the frame, and the and the ray gun is also breaking out of the frames it's really nice and dynamic there's no wonder i was trying to copy that and scribble it I'm trying to justify my graffiti <laughs> i don't know That's- if you follow the other doctor who novels on twitter i'm doctor who dr but the other guy is he the covers guy yeah is he the covers guy he does poll he does polls on the covers. so what he's up to now he's already done he's done the novelizations he's done the officially licensed novels he's done um, what he's doing now is fan art novelization covers. Oh yes, I've seen those. Yeah, he's taking fan art and he's doing covers either of new series stories that never got novelized, or he's doing alternate takes on classic series covers using fan art. And it's amazing; half the covers are Chris Achilleos pastiches. And it's gotten to the point where I'm saying I'm not voting for any more Achilleos because we've already got him. You know. I don't need to see another homage, but it, 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 the point is not that Jason is, uh, you know, insolent and churlish. The point is that Jason loves Achilleo so much that I want to see something else and not just an imitation of him. But there's a reason why everybody gravitates to drawing in his style, because it informs our childhood. It's visually pleasing. It's funny that the montage thing is like, is that peculiar to Doctor Who or do because because you know the montage has always been the doctor who thing it, it, does that where does that come from does it come from the covers is it because there are multiple doctors where you need i mean does does star trek have that as much of the, of, of that history of doing montages what's the deal well, the star trek books primarily come from the late 70s although i don't know if anybody who was working for their publisher would have heard, would have heard of the novel the doctor who novelizations because those didn't come over until a few years later they do sort of Alistair Pearson style. They use photo reference. So it's a drawing of a photograph and it'll be two or three heads on the page. And then the enterprise is in there or a planet, or if there's a Klingon or if there's some notable guest star, that'll be the cover, but they're not very cluttered. It's usually two or three heads. Whereas a lot of these Achilles pastiches that you see on the Dr. Who novels polls on Twitter, is you know people will try and stuff seven or eight different heads onto the same cover, which a little too much, a little too much. Yeah, it, but it seems to go through to like the big finish covers now, even to the Blu-ray box set collection sets. Now you've got okay, it's not a collection of heads, but you've still got the montage of monsters there. I don't know, maybe it's, I don't know if it's a Doctor Who thing. 
So here's my season 17 Blu-ray, which just arrived and it's still in its original shrink wrap, but this is rather economical because it's just, it's primarily Tom Baker in his season 17 oatmeal coat. And then if you dig in real close, you can see Lady Adrasta and Daleks, but it's very yeah. subtle. It's subtle and tasteful. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Whereas here is the new novelization of The Pirate Planet, which is also on my desk. This is Achilles style, but there's a lot going on here. There's the Doctor, there's Mary Tam, there's the Polyphase Avatron, there's the Pirate Captain, there's the Miasma, there's the Planet. There's some uh, comments in the background. I love the fact that... The- it is, yeah, yeah, and I love the fact that I just love the fact that the parrot, the robot parrot, is the biggest thing on that picture. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But it's Achilles on steroids for sure. Whereas yeah. I think simpler yeah. is a little better. Yeah. Let me on that. So that's the cover. Let's talk about the contents then. As you're reading must this we, now, must we? Can't we just talk about pictures? I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a fascinating read. So did you say how many times? So did you? When was the first time you said you said you read this? Was that? I was. I would have bought it when I was about twelve years old. I no longer remember. I can tell you where I bought it because I still have the price sticker on the cover. Adorable. And where does it? What B, does that say? That, that was that was the B. Dalton's bookseller price label. They had the beige strip, the white strip, and then the beige strip. So it's the store coding, the price, and the store coding. So uh, I know I bought this at the B. Dalton Booksellers at the Broadway Mall on Long Island, New York. So it would have been eighty-five or eighty-six when I bought this. Two dollars ninety-five. I'm- I think. Yeah, two ninety five. But I did not write the story code on the inside cover, and I didn't write a cast list. So I probably bought this towards the end of the first wave of my fandom when I was kind of drifting away, and I was, uh, you know, more into, uh, well, girls, you know, teenage boy. What yeah. can I say? That was my failing. So to, to, to be fair, not being, to be honest, being a teenage boy and going out and chasing uh, the sex you're interested in, rather than staying home watching sci fi books, is probably a good thing. <laughs> uh, probably, it's although probably uh, the, it is probably the healthiest, or the healthiest option, I'd imagine. I have some stories that might cause you to doubt that, but <laughs> we'll save wow, that for so another show entirely. That's another. That's the yeah, wait for Doctor Who novels, uh, not to literature late. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll be up with all those stories later. <laughs> Doctor Who literature unplugged. But if there's one thing I'm going to add, to, like yeah, I'm going to encourage in in your long journey on this fabulous podcast is that I want to I want to like. We want some good defacing because I know that, that a lot of your guests out there, being all high-minded and highfalutin, giving you all their literary critical theory, I bet those those bunch of ruffians scribbled in their books, drew in them, wrote lists, and I think you should you should dig. And I, I want to see all that stuff online. I think it's time to add graffiti's corner. You know, let's do this. When I just covered Genesis of the Daleks, I showed my guest the cast lists that I wrote in incoherent 12-year-old handwriting in ink on the inside cover. But I I do not have any illustrations. When I was in the eighth grade, 13 years old, in my creative writing class, Mrs. Koblenz, shout out if you were in that class, I really doubt anybody else who listens to this podcast was, but she made us store all of our creative writing in an 8.5 by 11 manila folder. And you could decorate the folder however you like. And by the end of the year, I had multiple canines. I had multiple Daleks exterminating. um, I had TARDISes. And of course, you know, you have a teacher probably in her mid-50s has never heard of Doctor Who. She was very confused by all these uh, robots and death rays on the cover of my creative writing folder. That's the folder that I've got to find. I don't know if it's, I don't know if I still have it anywhere. But if I could find that, that would be a really interesting glimpse into my mind in 1986. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. Well, I, I hope to see many more people scribbling. What does Cy Hart think? Where does Cy Hart, after you know, you're fant- you know, a librarian at heart through and through? What does he make of? Did, did he ever scribble in his books, or did he just probably he probably put little pockets with tickets in there and stamps? I bet. You know, he is my first three time guest. I have had him on the yeah. show three times, and he has discussed three different books with me. Right. So yeah. let's dig into the archives. He has been here to discuss the demons. He has been here to discuss the Loch Ness Monster, and he was just and on Genesis. episode three for Genesis. So he's been yeah. episodes eight, episodes 18, episodes 23, and as sure as eggs is eggs, he is going to be back on the show before too long. Although I have a little bit of a longer wait list now. I'm booked six months in advance, so you're not going to hear him again for a few months. But he will, okay. be, he will be back in those three episodes. We have never talked about illustrations on the inside of books. He has been holding out on me, I am sure. 
that there are yes. illustrations a la Sci Hard somewhere in Genesis or Demons or Loch Ness Monster. This is it. I think I think Defacer's Corner, it should be a new feature. We need to find out who your top defacers and uh, secret graffiti uh, people Speaking are. Speaking of features, it is time for one of the most popular features on this show, although the show is not popular yet. But among the people who like it, this is a popular feature. We're going to play a game, Conrad. Yes, we are. Are you ready to enter the gaming zone? Well, as I I am petrified of games, I never play them. I don't like winning. I don't like losing. It's the not taking part that counts for me with games. Um, And just to give you an indication, on the last one, I thought, I'm going to play along, and I got one out of six. But as the good doctor says, you know, courage is about feeling the fear and doing it anyway. So let's play this game. And if I can get more than one, I'll be happy. Let's do it. All right. Well, this one is a bit of a cheat, and you're going to probably guess it before I even finish reading out the words. But this is what I got. I may not. I'm really thick. This is what I got on the episode generator, and this is what it is. And let's play the clip. Octane? It's unpleasurable, is it? Shapley? And great, great. Yes, yes, it is possible, my boy. Very possible. Let from above the TARDIS, this dullitaire traffic. Dodo! Oh, my dear! My dear! <laughs> All right. That is the cliffhanger. And I think that's a little too easy, but I don't fight the random number generator. I take what no. I get. I'm now struggling to... Conrad is now going to tell us the episode name oh, and the story part. Sorry, I can't remember. I'm having a total blank. I can't remember where Dodo joins. My God, what's her first story? Come on, it's on the tip of my brain. This is why I don't play games. I can't, oh, God, I'm a bad fan. I can't even remember this. I've got a total blank on what story Dodo joined. You know what? You've been a good guest. You've listened to my stories. You've listened to my over-talking. I'm going to give you a hint. When Dodo joins, she joins in the last five minutes of a okay. different story. So you are hearing her joining scene, but this is the only scene in the story that she's in. I'm, I'm having a total blank, so I'm going to have to pass. I'm really sorry. I know it's an easy one. I told you I was bad at games. I'm going to pass. I'm gonna... Okay. We will let you come back to that at the end if it comes back to you within the next uh, five minutes. Unlikely. All right. All right, so let's try our second clip. Demon, if he comes out, we shall all die! No, you stop! Go back to the mark! Go back! You will destroy me! No! No! So that's, I'm going to say that's the demons, and I'm going to say episode four. All right, uh, you are definitely correct on the demons. I'm going to give you a hint on. I'm I'm going to give you a hint on the episode. This is a very funny bit of text commentary from the DVD range. There is a very small subset of cliffhangers which features the villain in trouble rather than the doctor. There is, um, it's and it's always the same episode where the villain is in danger with the cliffhanger, including (sighs) Miss, uh, including Lady Adrasta in Creature from the Pit. So that's three. Thank you. So what's your final answer? My final answer is three. Episode three of the demons? Yes. You are correct, and you are correct, and you have already Dude. beaten the score from when you played along oh, last time. Thank God for that. Right, here we go. Last one. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure I can put one more point on this, having been woeful with Dodo. Have you had have you had a chance to answer the first one yet, or is it still no, a blank I'm, for you? I'm total, I've got a total white noise on that one. Let's go for a third. All right, and here comes the clip.
resistance overcome. The beacon is ours. That. I just love Revenge of the Cybermen. Very, very beautiful. And that's Revenge 2. And. Hang on, no, no, wait, 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 wait. How did, how did you, how did you, well, we'll ask you, neither confirming nor denying the veracity of your answer, how did you deduce that? Okay, Revenge of the Cybermen, I mean, Cyber Leader, that, that kind of got me there. What the distinct of Black there? Helmet, yes. Yeah, that's, and, and that is one of my first, that's probably one of the first Doctor Who stories I saw. I was terrified of the Cybermat, I love that. Now let me get to the episode thing, so episode one is the Cybermat. Episode two. What are the others? No, I'm going to stick with two. I'm going to say Revenge 2. You are absolutely correct, because it is an article of faith that when Jerry Davis writes a Cyberman story, the Cybermen never show up until the halfway point. (gasps) I love that. Because you have to minimize the amount of time that the actors spend in these costumes, so you always keep your monster off screen until the absolute last minute. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, so how did I do? I've done, I've done three out of and what was it? What was it? You got, you got four, out, including the hint. You got four out of six, and we're just uh, waiting on an answer for that very first clip. And it was, and it was the, the it was the was it the first or the last? What was it? It was, it was the only episode that she was in. It was the only scene in the entire serial that she was in because remember she was introduced uh, sort of like at the, the very last minute, and then her first full story. Is the next story on, but it's her very first appearance, ever. God, I just do you know what? It's just no. It's, it's I can tell it's not coming. It's one of those bl- total blank moments. I'll kick myself. What's funny is we we have you know m- hundreds of episodes of the classic series, and I've only been doing this game for about a month, and this is already <laughs> the second Dodo cliffhanger that's come up. It is in fact. And it's a little bit of a cheat because it is not a cliffhanger per se, but because the Hartnell area was one long serial, yeah. even episode fours were cliffhangers. And this was episode four of The Massacre. God damn it. Yeah, of course. Right. That makes sense. It's totally there. I need to go back and do some more homework and rewatch The Massacre or re-listen to it. Or Well, you got four out of six, and that is a passing score. So you are considered a winner. A passing score? What would happen if I failed, like, completely? Like I did last week and got one out of six. Then you would have to come back on the show every single week and play the game over and over again <laughs> until you got four out of six. We play the contest again, Time Lord. Which was actually one of the cliffhangers from last time. There we go. It was the part two cliffhanger. It was the you're too late gasp doctor cliffhanger. And although I failed miserably... Actually, no, I didn't fail miserably. I got four out of six. But um, I'm going to give you a prize for this. Um, I don't know if you already have one of these, but when, after we get off the phone, I'm going to get your address, and I'm going to send you this, which I found while I was digging out my uh, uh, Planet of the Daleks book. So it's a badge. It's an original. You can see it's quite old there, oh, which I wow. must have picked up somewhere, which says, I am a Doctor Who reader. And you truly, if anybody is a Doctor Who reader, it's you. So I'm going to put this in the post to you as your prize for putting up with me through your podcast and quiz well thank you very much and i'm going to keep having you on and eventually i will have a full set of badges <laughs> Can have all the merch all the merch and i am going to show you when i was at galley because you were supposed to be with us at galley in february mm. yes and indeed. the coronavirus pandemic put a stop to that so i still have yet to meet you face to face but i was in the dealer's room and I was talking to my friend Dale Santos, who's been on the show in the past, talking about his Target collection. Mm-hmm. And he gave me, for inviting him on the show, this badge. He gave me a choice of badges, and I have this, which is a color photo of William Hartnell. Oh, oh very nice. It's color William Hartnell standing in front of the TARDIS, probably from the end of the Aztecs, I think was that famous shot. That, that's it, with the candle. Beautiful. There we go. My badge collection is is, is grow. My my army of badges awakes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we'll get this in the post to you, my friend, for sure. Conrad, thank you so much for joining us. We are going to have you. You are pinch hitting for somebody else in this episode, so thank you very much for the last minute. But you are also going to be on an episode that we have pre booked, and I'm not going to say which episode and which book, but I can confirm that you are going to be back on this show within the next few months, and I can't wait to have you back on again. 
Thank you so much, Jason. That was an absolute pleasure. Scribble in your books, people. That's what they're there for. Doctor Who on the Planet of the Daleks, written by Terence Dix, televised as Planet of the Daleks, teleplay by Terry Nation, televised in April and May 1973, published in October 1976. Joe peered through the panel and saw nothing, yet someone had entered the cabin. She could hear hoarse breathing and stealthy padding footsteps. A beaker rose in the air of its own accord and then dropped to the floor. The Invisible Enemy. After pursuing the Daleks through space, Doctor Who lands on the planet of Spyridon in the midst of a tropical jungle and finds more than Daleks. Vicious plants spitting deadly poison, invisible Spyridons attacking from all sides, and in hiding, a vast army waits for the moment to mobilize and conquer. Planet of the Daleks, the novelization, is somewhat unique for the target line in that it was the novelization published directly after the novelization of the TV story that directly preceded it, Frontier in Space, printed as Doctor Who and the Space War, which we discussed last week on this program, episode 25, with my guest Daniel Knight. But even though the two books are linked, there is a major discontinuity between them, which matters not at all, not to me, buying this book out of sequence about nine years after publication, Not to most target readers, and there are many of us left, based on this podcast listening numbers, who also read these books out of sequence, mostly by chance, or whim, or at random. However, it has to be said that Wolf Frontier and Planet on TV form a loosely linked 12-part story, two connected six-part adventures, with only the Doctor, Joe, and the Daleks in common. The two books don't connect up in the way that Frontier Episode 6 and Planet Episode 1 link up. Doctor Who and the Space War ends with the Doctor escaping from the Master, almost but not quite shooting him, and the Master getting the last word on the novelization. The Doctor has escaped unharmed. But Planet of the Daleks, the book, opens with the Doctor, deathly ill. The Space War book had a vastly different ending from Frontier on TV, where the cliffhanger to Episode 6 was a bit of a botched rush job, needing footage ported over from the making of Planet, shot months later, to end at all. But Frontier in Space did end with the Doctor ill, and the first few scenes of Planet, which Terrence truncates heavily for the novelization, address that illness. Here, the book begins in mid-scene, with the third Doctor already unconscious, and Joe dictating the exposition into the never-seen-before-and-never-seen-again TARDIS log. This is excellent work by Terrence, slicing and dicing the TV scripts, How else do you fit a six-part TV story into a book whose text runs only 119 pages? But it is confusing if you're reading the books in publication or story order. While the material is condensed, Terence has the ability to set a remarkable scene in the minimum possible words. Here is how he describes the Spyridon jungle in anthropomorphic terms. A stretch of dense jungle, vines, trees, creepers, and strangely shaped plants jostling each other for room. Joe knew at once she was not on Earth. The vegetation was alien, with a sinister, fleshy quality, as though this jungle was really one enormous beast. This contrasts effectively with the description of the comatose doctor in the next paragraph as, quote, as cold and still as the stone effigy on a crusader's tombstone. By page 11, the fifth page of the text, Terence is talking about super-modern cities in Brazil, just miles from crumbling abandoned temples. This is a writer who is able to drop exposition, references to the Crusaders, and a travelogue of Rio de Janeiro, all within six paragraphs. Oh, and he nods his head towards the previous book's adapted title, referencing a plot to cause a space war. Now, again, this is not Terence's most lavish book, but he does give you a value when you measure the book's price against its teeny tiny page count. David Maloney directed Planet for TV with a memorably rich color palette, which Conrad and I discussed earlier, and Terence tries to play along on page 11, showing how dull green murk gives way to yellow glare. And Conrad wants me to mention, it didn't occur to him until after we finished recording, but he enjoys the line on page 11, the temperature rose dramatically, and it was dawn, 
just as if someone had switched on the light. The studio light, that is. Terence's descriptions of two of the main Thal guest cast, introduced in a single paragraph in Chapter 2, are so good that the savvy reader will know which actors played which on TV without even needing to consult the cast list. Bernard Horsfall is, quote, very big with a long, bony face at once kindly and stern. Prentice Hancock is smaller, thin-faced, and younger, with a fierce, angry look about him. And several pages later, speaks with a harsh bitterness that sounded habitual. Though I got to speak to Prentice at Gallifrey One about five years ago, and boy, is he just the nicest, most unassuming guy. Codal, on the next page, is described as openly frightened, which nicely sets up the character's thematic story arc over the rest of the six episodes. The episode one material takes up just two short chapters in the book, 20 pages, so Terence condenses a lot of intercut scenes from TV. Oh, the editing genius of David Maloney. These become long, sequential sections in the book, removing a lot of dialogue, especially from the early Joe and Dr. Tardis scenes. But he does go back and add manners to the often brusque Pertwee Doctor. When Taran rescues the Doctor from a locked Tardis, and from Space Fungus in Chapter 2, the Doctor and Prince says, It seems I must thank you for saving my life a second time. <laughs> That's sweet. On TV, not so much. They spread their spores in that liquid they've discharged. And the fungus spreads very quickly unless the surface has been specially treated. Turn your hand over. Yeah, that should be all right now. No. Well, what would have happened? Without special treatment, it would have spread all over your body. That's nice. Until finally, you'd have been engulfed by it. Oh. And there's a reason why the Pertwee Doctor's moments of charm were called just that. Moments, rather than a charming personality or an entire five-season incarnation of charm. Chapter 3 is another case study in the ongoing example of how Terence views the Doctor as an intellectual hero who's the center of the narrative. For those of us younger readers, I know, I know, you're saying, but Jason, 48 and a half, is not young. But remember, this particular story is still older than I am. My generation of fandom came of age with the virgin books of the 1990s, the N.A.s and the M.A.s, where the Doctor was to be kept at a remove and never the focus of POV scenes. Terence, however, dips into the Doctor's head with surprising frequency and success. Quote, The Doctor started examining the Dalek with an air of brisk competence, is one look at our hero. Terence also narrates his thought processes in unpacking the rivalry between Taran and Weber, the two principal Thal roles. What's interesting is that on TV, Weber acknowledges that Taran is second in command among the Thals, and rightly in charge of the expedition, following the death of the mission commander before the story began. But Terence applies another one of his subtle fixes, one I certainly missed until this week. It's Weber who was second in command on the exposition, and Taran has taken over only on a technicality, and that provides a much more interesting dynamic and antagonism, exclusive to the book. Kotal, who's had zero personality in the book to date, warms up early in Chapter 3 while discussing the science of the native Spyrodon's invisibility as, quote, recognizing a fellow spirit, and, quote, talking as one dedicated scientist to another with the Doctor. On TV, Kotal impulsively leads a patrol of Spyrodons away from our heroes early in Episode 2, but in the book, Terence dips away from the Doctor and into Kotal's head to set up the themes of cowardice versus courage, for which Kotal is best remembered in this story. Chapter 3 is also an example of how Terence reorders the text. Instead of all the intercutting from TV, the narrative is limited to three sections, the Doctors, Joes, and the Doctors. The TV scene, a short two-hander between Taran and Kotal, is dropped, deleted with no loss to the story. In Chapter 4, Terence explains why all the Dalek sets are windowless rooms set underground. Quote, It was normal Dalek practice to install their bases underground whenever possible. Daylight and open air meant nothing to them, and they flourished best in a controlled underground environment. Funny to mention that, because here we are now 46 years after the book came out, and even in the bigger budgeted new series, the Daleks still tend to install their bases underground, without daylight or open air. 
However, as I alluded to in the intro, this is a very short book. We're not quite at the 95-page novelization days that are coming later in the 1970s, but a lot of TV material does have to go to fit Terrence's time and page count. That short Taron and Kotal scene early in episode 2 was no loss, but one of my favorite scenes of the entire Pertwee era is slashed to ribbons in chapter 4. You know what you did back there, leading the searchers away from us, was very courageous. I just didn't give myself time to think. If I had, I certainly wouldn't have taken the risk. No, I think you're doing yourself rather an injustice there. If you hadn't acted the way you did, we'd have all been captured. They give medals for that sort of bravery. Bravery? I've been terrified ever since I landed on this planet. It's different for Taran and Weber. They're professionals. They've seen action before. Do you think they're any the less brave because of that? They know how to deal with fear. They're used to living close to death. I'm not. I'm a scientist, not an adventurer. Well, forgive me if I'm wrong, but aren't you a volunteer? Yes. Then you must have known what you were getting into. No. None of us did. We're not a warlike people, Doctor. We've only just developed space flight. No one had attempted a voyage of this length before. But every man and woman from my division volunteered. Over 600 of them. You see, I didn't even have the courage to be the odd man out. What are you laughing at? Uh, you, my friend. You may be a very brilliant scientist, but you have very little understanding of people, particularly yourself. Courage isn't just a matter of not being frightened, you know. What is it, then? It's being afraid and doing what you have to do anyway. Now, the broad outlines of that scene are still in the book, but there's maybe only 60% of the dialogue left and it passes by with much less poetry and impact. The scene in the book is okay, but it's missing the heart that John Pertwee and Tim Priest gave it in the clip we just heard. Later scenes from episode 2 without any of the main cast members, such as scenes between the Daleks or between Taron and Kotal, also fly by. Though as Weber pulls a gun on Taron, Terrence does add an interesting beat where Weber is, quote, unnerved by Taron's calm. But while material is condensed from TV, episode 2 takes up just 18 pages, Terrence is still not one to let a scene pass by with no gloss. The introduction of Wester, Roy Skelton's friendly invisible spyrodon, includes a description of what Joe's fungus healing potion tastes like, quote, tart and sweet at the same time. And there's almost nearly a song lyric made famous by Billie Holiday in the West Village, out of context, as Wester and Joe feast on strange-looking fruits. With a limited supply of Thals in the first two episodes, Terry Nation introduces three more for episode three. Rebek is a major character and appears solo at the episode two cliffhanger. Marit and Latep, man, Terry Nation really seems to have gotten all of his character names out of a random five-letter word generator, as if getting ready to invent Wordle 50 years early. Anyway, Marit and Latap show up seconds into episode 3, and Terence describes them both in the same paragraph. One, a tall, muscular man with a fresh, open face. The other, scarcely more than a boy. Which one is which? Does it matter? Marit has few lines on TV, almost entirely plot functional, and even fewer lines in the book, where Terence, especially in chapter 5, deletes what little Marit had to say. Latep does get off a joke about Marit being a terrible pilot, which isn't on TV. Terence also gives a better explanation for the fashionable purple furs worn by the Spyridons. On TV, it's said to protect them against the cold, but in the book, it's so that they're visible to their Dalek masters. I much prefer the book explanation. On page 52, when he's not busy rearranging scenes or condensing intercut TV sequences into single sections, Terence alludes to the manner in which young children in the UK enjoyed Doctor Who during its classic run. Joe hides from the Daleks in their control room in a, quote, gap, rather like that between a sofa and a wall. Chapter 6 sees Terence invent action and drama, where the TV serials skated by on eye-pleasing set designs and color schemes. Here, the Doctor causes a lift 
in which he and Kotal are trapped by Daleks waiting at the exits, to plunge rapidly to the lowest level of the Daleks complex, level zero, to help them evade capture. On TV, they merely stumble upon a level where there are no Daleks blocking the lift exits. Marit's death is also restaged and simplified. Instead of a drawn-out moment where the Doctor repeatedly urges the actor to safety, in the book that's condensed into two paragraphs, where Marit impulsively sacrifices himself to the Daleks' fire. Quote, Marit, at the rear of the little group, glanced nervously at the slowly opening doors, then at the advancing Daleks. Five people had to get through those doors and close them again before the Daleks were near enough to fire. There wasn't enough time. Before anyone could stop him, Marit yelled, Get inside, all of you! Drawing his blaster, he began running towards the Daleks. As if astonished, the Daleks halted their advance. Marit had time to fire only once. The Daleks spun round under the effect of his blaster, and immediately the rest of the Daleks fired in unison. Marit's smoking body was slammed across the corridor. The Doctor's escape up the ventilation shaft, which forms the basis for the Episode 3 cliffhanger, here is narrated partly from the Doctor's POV. Terence explains that the Doctor's mind is full of calculations about weight, lift, and gravity. Terence, also writing this after he'd novelized the Third Doctor's eventual death in Planet of the Spiders, discussed here with Graham Burke in Episode 16, drops back a hint for those of you reading this story in story order rather than publication order. Curiosity had always been his strongest characteristic. Page 64. The Daleks' frozen army is much more impressive here than all those toy models on TV. Bottom paragraph of page 64. The Doctor was staring in sheer amazement at one of the most astonishing sights he had ever seen. The window looked out onto an enormous, dimly lit cavern, metal catwalks round its walls. The cavern was so vast that its furthest walls were lost in shadow, and it was completely filled with row upon row of Daleks, thousands of them, rank after rank, standing completely still, wisps of icy vapor drifting about their bodies. The whole army of Daleks, silent, motionless, waiting. Coming up after the break, we'll take a look at the final six chapters, representing episodes four, five, and six on television. The load getting a little heavy. I don't think I'm equipped to handle all this anymore. No? Why? Just because you found out that you're not made of stone? This job doesn't allow for human weakness. And they should have sent a machine, shouldn't they? I thought they had. I was wrong. Good. Because the business of command is not for a machine, is it? The moment we forget that we're dealing with people, then we're no better off than the machines that we came here to destroy. When we start acting and thinking like the Daleks, Darren, the battle is lost. I appreciate Terence's propensity for adding in humor whenever he can, sometimes in sympathy with the characters, sometimes in sarcastic disbelief at the original script, and here, for a script that he himself commissioned and edited, a little of both. On page 69, Joe is hiding out on the Daleks' underground base and decides to hide by co-opting the native Spyrodon's fashionable purple furs. Terence writes, The robe was far too big, but that was all to the good. It covered her entire body from head to foot, and the loose sleeves concealed her hands. It didn't seem to bother the Daleks that they were being trailed by a very small Spyrodon. Presumably, Spyrodon slaves were beneath their notice. Then that scene, by the way, in Chapter 7 is a plot fix. On TV, Joe goes from Dalek base to outside, following them across the Spyrodon surface with seeming impunity. For the book, Terence makes sure to explain how she got from point A to point B under Dalek noses, so to speak, without being spotted. Terence also says, tongue firmly in cheek on page 78, that the Thals had seemingly inexhaustible backpacks containing food and fuel and delicious hot soup. The book does not always capture the incredible unique chemistry between John Pertwee and Katie Manning. When the Doctor and Joe reunite in Chapter 8 for the first time since the first page, Terence tells us, Joe began pouring out a confused account of her adventures, but the Doctor stopped her. 
There'll be plenty of time for explanations later, he tells her in the book. Now that's adequate, but it is not this. Uh, look, Doctor, the last I heard about you, you've been captured by the Daleks, yes, right? Yes, yes, and I was told yes, that they were going to take you because they're doing all these experiments, right? And I thought you were going to be in Joe, Joe, please. Will you excuse us for a moment? My friend has rather lots to clear up about. Sure. Oh, doctor, wait till you hear what happened to me. It was terrible. And then I got rescued by this bull. And then I got rescued by this bull. My gosh, I love those two. Joe is just a little more Joe on TV. Now in the book, she says the doctor, describing the frontier in space cliffhanger, the one you won't find in the frontier novelization, collapsed, quote unquote. On TV, Katie says instead, flaked out which is much more period-appropriate and much more Joe-appropriate. Episode 4 on TV is where Joe meets Latep, the Thal who falls in love with her and then proposes at the end of the story. On TV, this can all be played by fond looks and nonverbal interplay between the actors. In the book, you don't have the benefit of that, but fortunately, we have Terrence to fill the void. He writes, quote, She decided she quite liked the look of him. That's Latep. He had a cheerful open face, and as the youngest and smallest of the Thals, he was the only one anywhere near her own age and size. All the rest of them towered over her, and they seemed terribly serious about everything. Characters don't often have time to dream or even sleep in most classic Doctor Who, but on page 85, Terence allows Joe some sleep at the Plain of Stones, and gives her, quote, a confused dream about holidays on the French Riviera. Reading through the episode 5 material which, of course, I mistakenly marked off as episode 4 in my copy of the book, I see that Terence has condensed a lot of scenes. Chapter 9 is, as its number implies, only 9 pages long, but covers a much longer stretch of TV material. The only things added that weren't on TV were Joe lamenting that, if the Doctor just explained himself once in a while, things would be less chaotic. Then the Doctor adds a sad eulogy for Weber. He was rash and impulsive, poor fellow. In Chapter 10, once the Daleks are shoved into the frozen pools, killing the mutants within, a scene memorialized on that lovely Chris Achilleos cover, Terence gives us a tantalizing glimpse of what the creature inside the Dalek casing looks like, with Taran and Latep shuddering at the sight of the hideous creatures housed inside. But that's as close a look as we get. And what we don't get a look at is Wester on TV, after Wester sacrifices himself towards the end of Episode 5, and there's a lot of characters who die by sacrifice, as you'd expect in any Terry Nation script. Wester turns visible in death, but that just doesn't happen on the book the way that it did on television. The episode 6 material also flies by in a hurry, taking up just 20 pages of text. The resolution to the episode 5 cliffhanger is simplified and disposed of in a few paragraphs, rather than several intercut scenes on TV. In what I imagine was a change made from the original script for television, Rebic gets a line about the Dalek army being armed with invisibility, but on the book that's reallocated or returned to the Doctor on page 107. More interesting on page 109 is another variation on a classic and oft-used Terence line, the Doctor cursed fluently in an obscure Martian dialect. While most of this chapter is a drastic reduction in dialogue and pacing from the TV episode, Chapter 11 does end with one of those perfect, economical, but quite unmistakably, Terence sentences. An absolute page-turner, economical but vocabulary-rich. Sluggishly, reluctantly, but quite unmistakably, the army of Daleks had started to come to life. I dare you to put the book down at that page, I really do. Now Terence likes to quote Casablanca and Shakespeare in the novelizations quite a bit, but he also puts in a rare biblical allusion on page 115 here, the Doctor feeling like Daniel in the lion's den as he's surrounded by awakening Daleks. Terence also compares these Daleks to a ghastly slow-motion football game with thousands of players on the other side. On page 120, the Supreme Dalek announces, We are abandoning. That's nice. On TV, the same Dalek gets to say the line five times over. Book, nice. TV production, awesome. The rest of Chapter 12 is an odd case of things removed and things added. The long and effective farewell scene with the Thals is decimated, 
Taryn losing a bunch of lines, and Coda losing his emotional thank you to the Doctor for lessons learned about bravery. Those are big losses, but Terrence covers a big plot hole, how the Doctor manages to get through inside a TARDIS door that's been blocked by deadly fungus, long forgotten since episode one, that also adds a longer chasing with the Daleks. And Terrence adds real literary value to the surviving Daleks' final scene in the book. I'm quite fond of this paragraph, Terrence at his most descriptive and propulsive. The Dalek Supreme turned arrogantly to his aides. It had been a day of total catastrophe. The army buried, the Spiridon expedition wiped out, the city destroyed. Any other life form would have been crushed by despair. But Daleks do not recognize defeat. They ignore it and carry on their chosen path of conquest and destruction. The final scene, though, inside the TARDIS loses a bit of agency for Joe. In the book, the Doctor suggests Earth as, quote, this little world that Joe might like to visit. But on TV, all the choices belong to Joe in what will be a lead-up to her final story. Well, her final story until 2010, that is. Let's give a listen. But Joe, that's only one little world. There's so many hundreds of others to see. There's only one little world I want to see right now. That one. That one? But Joe, that's Earth. That's right, Doctor. Home. Home it is, Miss Grant. Next time, we jump forward two months. This time, with the line taking a month off, it'll be December 1976. In New York, that was the month a young Jason started preschool, and just a few days after Reggie Jackson signed what was then a record-setting $3 million five-year contract with the New York Yankees. In the UK, however, Terrence Dix releases one of his stone-cold bests, and we're going to have not one guest, but two. One of them an insider with intimate knowledge of the TV story to discuss Doctor Who and the pyramids of Mars. Join us as we discuss Terence's gift of literature to all humanity. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. Special thanks to my special guest, the amazing Conrad Westmus. This podcast is brought to you by Anchor and can also be found on Spotify and Google Podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels, and you can also find me on the Trap One podcast from time to time. I write about Doctor Who on Twitter using the hashtag Doctor Who Pilgrimage, that's DR Who Pilgrimage. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Next time we'll be discussing another novelization. And we'll again be joined by two very special guests. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages.